Colorado's High Definition News Leader. This is News Channel 13, where the news comes first. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us at noon. I'm Brittany Bailey. And I'm John Carroll. One day before the first anniversary of the Black Forest Fire, we are getting answers in an after action report. A news conference just wrapped up where the sheriff's office summarized that report. KRDO News Channel 13's Emily Allen was at that news conference and she joins us now live with the latest on what came out of today's meeting and that report. Now, Emily, what new information can you tell us about the Black Forest Fire? John and Brittany, the press conference just wrapped up here at the sheriff's office a little bit ago. Sheriff Terry Makita stressed repeatedly that his office learned a lot from the Waldo Canyon fire that helped improve response during the Black Forest fire. The sheriff pointed out a lot of strengths during the Black Forest fire. He says military agencies responded more quickly than they did in the Waldo Canyon fire. He also says information was given to the public much better than it was during the Waldo Canyon fire. Sheriff Makita says it was chaotic at the beginning of the Black Forest fire on June 11th and it took a long time to get some of those pieces into place. Now in the past he's criticized Fire Chief Bob Harvey with the Black Forest Fire Department for his handling of the Black Forest fire. He says he didn't pass command of the fire to the sheriff's office sooner and that delayed resources from getting into the firefight. Now I asked Sheriff Makita after the press conference wrapped up and there was open for questions whether he thought that things had changed in light of reviewing this after action report. He says he does still stand behind what he said about Fire Chief Bob Harvey's response. It took hours after the fire was delegated to the Type 3 team to determine what resources were there, what they were engaged in, and what they had. And in any event, you need to establish that command and control. You need to announce who the incident commander is. And that incident commander needs to have a resource that is tracking who is responding, have them sign in, check what equipment they have, and then deploy that equipment in an organized manner. The sheriff's office has not determined what started the fire. However, they have rolled up out a couple of different causes. I'll have more on that coming up at Cardio News Channel 13 at 1230. Back to you guys. All right, thanks so much, Emily. Well, this is the first time Sheriff Makita has made a public appearance since the allegations against him surfaced. He's accused of creating a hostile work environment and promoting three women in the sheriff's office to positions they didn't earn. KRDO News Channel 13's Rana Novini is live at the sheriff's office and has what Makita said when asked about the investigation into the allegations against him. Good afternoon, Rana. Good afternoon, John and Brittany. The sheriff made it clear at the beginning of the press conference that he did not want to answer any questions that did not pertain to the fire, but still people wanted to know why they should trust him on the fire report and on any other matter because of the accusations against him. Makita said that the distractions at the sheriff's office only pertain to him. They do not affect any of his employees at the sheriff's office. He said everyone is still doing their job. Nearly two weeks ago, the Board of County Commissioners unanimously asked Sheriff Makita to resign. But he told us last week and reiterated today that he has no plans to step down. We're here to talk about a disaster that took place in this county and the citizens deserve the answers to that. The citizens will get the answers when this independent investigation that I fully support is completed. Again, Makita is accused of sexual favoritism, creating a hostile work environment, and misusing taxpayer dollars by taking vacations with three women at the sheriff's office. We'll have much more on his responses to the questions that were asked today about the accusations against him coming up on KRDO News Channel 13 starting at 4 o'clock. Reporting live at the sheriff's office, Rana Novini, KRDO News Channel 13. Rana, thank you. We're learning new information about El Paso County Under Sheriff Paula Presley. She went on sick leave last week. A 420-page personnel file has been released. Right now, Presley makes $118,000 a year. She started in 1985 as a dispatcher, was promoted to patrol sergeant, then deputy, then lieutenant. In 2003, she was promoted to comptroller, where she oversaw contracts and budgets. In 2009, she turned in her badge. There's no reason given in her personnel file. But in a matter of months, she was back with a $4,000 raise. Her records show she was reprimanded twice for car accidents. She was promoted to undersheriff in 2012. If she's on sick leave for more than 30 days, she and the commander who's filling in for her will both receive $118,000 salaries. 
Well, now we want to turn our attention to our weather forecast on this Tuesday afternoon and send things over to Storm Tracker 13 meteorologist Marty Vinachinque. Tracking what's been a really lovely day across the area. We've kept the wind down in most cases. We've had a lot of sunshine, obviously. Just recently, some clouds are starting to float over the mountains, and SkyScan actually picking up on a few radar returns out across the continental divide, an indication that, as we mentioned this morning, there might be a few sprinkles around over our mountain areas a little later on today. But in the meantime, we're just watching some clouds come over the mountains now. It is up to 70 degrees at the Greater Woodland Park Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. Calm wind. Nice to be able to report that to you. We have had a few breezy pockets along the front range. On occasion, I've seen it up around 10 to 15 miles an hour, but not really much stronger than that. Bourbon Brothers Southern Kitchen, 75 degrees. Wind is less than 10 miles an hour there. It's still calm. Parkview Medical Center in Pueblo, where it's a very comfy 78 degrees. So if you're out about the rest of the day, keep the sunscreen with you, maybe some water. I mean, it's very warm. We'll end up staying in the 80s for much of the afternoon in both Colorado Springs and Pueblo once we get there and then fall back into the 60s and 70s by 9. Again, there could be a few sprinkles over the mountains this evening. We don't expect much. Better chance for some thunderstorms the next couple of days. We'll talk more about that in our main weather segment. John and Brittany, back to you. All right, thanks so much, Marty. Right now, volunteers are out in the heat, raking and digging hard at work. It's all to help out with high-priority flood mitigation near the Waldo Canyon burn scar. The Coalition for the Upper South Platte, or CUSP, is working in Cascade today to protect communities and homes that get rocked by flash flooding. That's where KRDO News Channel 13's Bonnie Silkman is right now, joining us live from the project site. Good afternoon, Bonnie. Good afternoon, John and Brittany. That's right. We're here in Cascade, right at the flood mitigation project site, and we're very close to the Waldo Canyon burn scar. If you have actually take a look behind me, we're just a couple hundred yards away from the very edge of the Waldo Canyon burn scar, and that's exactly why this area is so prone to flash flooding, and that's why volunteers and CUSP are here today getting their hands dirty right here in the field. Now, right now I'm joined by one of the technicians working in the field today, working with CUSP. This is Wendy Warren. Thanks so much for joining, joining us today, Wendy, and tell us, why is the work here in this area of Cascade just so important? Um, so right below us, this channel runs right down through a whole bunch of houses. And then below the houses, we have um, the library and then also the fire station. And then um, right below that is also the highway and um, Fountain Creek, which obviously leads down into Manitou. And I understand um, the fire station actually was blocked in from getting hit by the floods several times last year. Yeah, if they don't act quickly to get their equipment out, they can be blocked off by the flooding. So it's really important that we take some measures to um, lessen the effects of the flooding through Ab there. Absolutely. And I see there are some volunteers behind us here. Can you tell us what they're doing here today? So these guys are laying in um, jute matting here. The, this is sort of the last stage. They the big machinery put in the sediment catchment basins and they have raked and seeded this hill slope and then they um, take the jute matting and they lay it down and that's going to help stabilize this hill slope um, so that when water comes down hopefully less of it will end up going down the hill. Okay and as you mentioned before this is high priority flood work and another reason that this is so urgent not only because because monsoon season is yeah. closely here that's actually when this area was hit so hard last year in July and in July is actually when your funding will be cut. Yeah, so the funding for this project ends on July 4th, so we need to get all the work done as soon as possible. All right. Well, Wendy, thank you so much. And as you can see, there are about four volunteers here today. They're going to continue working on this, and they'll have more day days set up to work on this flood mitigation project in the future. If you'd like to help out, we'll post that information right on our website, caredio.com. For now, reporting live in Cascade, Bonnie Silkman, Caredio News Channel 13. Thanks so much, Bonnie. And Bonnie mentioned those extra opportunities to help. There will be two more chances if you want to get out and help. Your next chance is Thursday, and then there's another Tuesday, June 24th. Both are from 8.30 until 2.30. As Bonnie said, you can find those dates and more information at krdo.com. A student was killed at a high school near Portland, Oregon, and authorities say the gunman is also dead. It's new at noon. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office said there were reports of shots fired around 8 this morning at Reynolds High School in Troutdale. Students were evacuated from the school with their hands on their heads to be reunited with their parents in a supermarket parking lot. We'll have the very latest on this shooting coming up at 4. Military officials said that five American troops were killed in an apparent coalition airstrike in southern Afghanistan. They were special operations forces on patrol with Afghan forces. They came under fire, and the air support they called in may have made a major mistake with tragic consequences. 
ABC News' Karen Travers has new information at noon. A tragic mistake in Afghanistan may have led to the deaths of five U.S. service members. American Special Operations Forces were out on a security patrol with Afghan forces along the southeastern border with Pakistan. They were ambushed by the Taliban and came under heavy fire. They called for air support, U.S. warplanes to come out to assist. Sources said there was a miscommunication about where exactly the bomb should be dropped, and it looks like a U.S. B-1 bomber dropped it on the wrong spot. Five Americans and one Afghan were killed. It's unclear how many others were wounded. This could be the worst friendly fire incident in the nearly 14-year war. It comes just two weeks after President Obama made a surprise visit to Afghanistan. For many of you, this will be your last tour in Afghanistan. Days later, he announced the drawdown plan that would end U.S. combat operations there. Now we're finishing the job we started. Right now, there are 32,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan. That figure will drop to 9,800 after combat operations end this year. By the end of 2015, that number would be cut by about half to around 4,900. U.S. casualties have declined significantly as forces have pulled back to let the Afghans take the lead. This is the kind of patrol Americans will not be doing by the end of this year. Karen Travers, ABC News, Washington. There is a memorial service going on right now at Fort Carson to honor a fallen soldier. It's happening at the Provider Chapel. Private First Class Jacob Weikstra was killed in Afghanistan last month in an aircraft accident. Weikstra's funeral was yesterday and flags across the state were at half staff. You can watch News Channel 13 starting at 4 for more on that memorial and will include the traditional roll call, a rifle squad salute and a final tribute with the playing of taps. We are getting a closer look inside the Martin Drake power plant today. Looking ahead, the media tour will start in about two hours. The city will be showing what progress has been made since a fire last month. Springs Utilities has said it wants the plant back online as soon as possible to help reduce costs to customers. The fire caused by oil spraying on hot pipes forced the plant to shut down. Hillary Clinton's new book is out today, and the former first lady has been speaking about some of her hard choices with Diane Sawyer and Robin Roberts. We'll have a closer look coming up. A relationship expert is speaking out about the fallout from online dating, and he's turning the spotlight on himself. Severe weather like we saw over the weekend around here is highlighting the importance of cell phones in tracking storms.